I'm going to get this meeting started because it is the top of the hour. So, or at least it's it's the top of the hour where I am, and it's it's uh, it's the half hour where uh, where Sam is. But uh, welcome everybody to the uh, July seventh uh, edition of the uh, Vancouver Power BI Modern Excel User Group Meetup. Uh, we've got Sam Vide is with us today to be talking about his Universal Data Consolidator tool. Uh, but before we jump into that, uh, I just want to uh, give you a quick uh, quick overview of where we're going here. Uh, so. Uh, hold on one second here. Let me just go and do that. So um, basically, uh, here we go. We're going to jump into the welcome and overview portion right now. So uh, as always, I just want to throw out a big shout out to the sponsors that make this thing happen. Skillwave.training, which is my training company, where we teach you how to learn better, faster, working with all kinds of good stuff around Excel and Power BI, data modeling, Power Query, things like that. Uh, Excel Guru is my company, is parent company of Skillwave uh, Training. Um, and we also serve up the monkey tools add-in which helps you build better models faster with uh, Power Query and Power Pivot, helps you audit them and hopefully makes you a little bit more productive. Um, our next meetups that we have coming up, uh, we're going to be back at our regularly regularly scheduled start time on uh, Thursday, July 21st. We've got Parv Chana is going to be joining us again and talking about the power of calculation groups and best practices. So very much looking forward to, uh, to having Parv back on the show. It's been quite a while. I'm also super excited to announce that I'm finally getting Chandu to show up as well. So on July 28th, Chandu is going to be joining us to talk about how to make impossible charts with Power Query trickery. I can't say that I've ever seen anybody build a chart with Power Query yet, so this is going to be a fun one, and I know Chandy is going to have some great stuff up his sleeve for it. So looking forward to, uh, to both of these. Uh, remember, Monkey Tools has its own dedicated website now. If you haven't checked out Monkey Tools yet, you should hop over there and have a quick look at what this software can do. You can even download a free version or a trial of the pro version uh, or you know, buy the full version as well if you like. But uh, I think you'll find that this is, uh, becomes an invaluable tool for you if you are working with Power Query and Power Pivot in Excel. The uh, one thing I want to mention here is that I have a few of my uh, self-service BI bootcamp uh, options open right now for registration. Uh, my flights are booked. My hotels are booked for Mississauga, Ontario on August 10th to 12th. And I'm really looking forward to uh, to being there and actually doing the first in-person on-site training that I have done since this pandemic broke. Uh, I know that Stanton uh, is going to be joining me. I'm looking forward to, uh, to hopefully having others. So if you are interested in uh, coming to Ontario, and getting some uh, exposure to this stuff uh, in, you know, in person, uh, the registrations are still open and we do still have space. We also have the online version of our self-service BI bootcamp. If you're not feeling comfortable being in the classroom, uh, the next semester of that will kick off on July 19th, and that's open for registration now. And if you decide to be really luxurious, or maybe you actually live closer, uh, I will also be leading a live on-site version of this bootcamp in Auckland, New Zealand from November 30th to December 2nd. So uh, lots of different options there. Um, I hope that you'll check out one of them and uh, say, come and, and let me help you change your reporting game forever. There's a lot of great stuff that we teach here and uh, the students of our program have found it uh, very positive and invaluable stuff. So we're hoping to always get more people. Um, as always, the YouTube recording of this particular presentation will be posted within 24 to 48 hours on the SkillWave YouTube channel. You can find the link here. Of course, all of these slides are already posted on the Meetup site as well. Uh, our Monkey Shorts videos are uh, going out every week on the SkillWave YouTube channel. This morning, we have a video on how to use Power Query IntelliSense <clears throat> properly, something that I struggle with, to be honest with you. Uh, this is part one. There's a part two coming up next week on this as well. Uh, I also got a lot of... Um, I got a lot of really positive comments on uh, Excel's let equals DAX's var function as well. So if you haven't checked that out, uh, you might want to take a look at that one too. Three minutes or less, nice targeted uh, targeted hits of, uh, of early morning long, early morning learning every Thursday morning. Finally, if you would like to get involved to come and speak at Vanpug, you can do so. The link is here, and uh, this is actually how Sam contacted us, and uh, one of uh, many that have contacted us through this stuff. Uh, we would love to give you an opportunity to come and actually present on our platform. We always love new speakers. Get in touch with us, fill out the form, and we will get back in touch with you and give you a platform to talk about on, on anything related to Excel, Power BI, Power Query, Power Pivot. As long as it ties into those technologies, we'd love to have you. So something to keep in mind. And on that note, that's the end of my slide. So um, what I'm gonna do, Sam, is uh, I'm gonna open this up to you. If you wanna share your screen, it's your turn, my friend. Thank you. No worries. All right, so I hope uh, I hope my screen is visible. 
It is perfect. I can see it. You bet. Thank you. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening from whichever time zone you're logging in. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so I'm just going to do a quick intro. Uh, my name is Samir Bhade, Sam to all my friends. I'm an electrical engineer by qualification. Uh, teaching Excel started off as a hobby. It was something I was doing over the weekends once in a while. So in case you're wondering how did an electrical engineer end up teaching Excel? <laughs> Stories like this, it began with my first job which was with a company called uh, Kiloska Electric uh, in Bangalore uh, in the year 95. So in those days, uh, Kiloska Electric was a very chaotic place to work. Everything was wanted yesterday. All right, so I can see some of you are smiling, which means it must be pretty much the same situation in many companies today. But what it meant was uh, there was a lot of time pressure on the work that I was doing, and I started looking for a tool that would help me automate my day-to-day -day work and Excel was this tool. So I started dabbling in Excel. Four years later, I got reasonably good at it. Uh, I left Kiloska in 99. I joined another company called VA Tech. VA Tech was an Austrian multinational. Uh, today it's a part of Siemens. So the biggest advantage I had working with uh, VA Tech was uh, not that there was no work. It offered me a five day week job compared to a six day week job in Kiloska. So it gave me one extra day. Uh, when I left Kiloska, fortunately for me, my boss at that time also left and he joined a consulting company and he knew I was good in Excel. So he called me up one day and said, Sam, you anyway have no work on a Saturday apart from roaming on MG Road. Now, this is something that uh, people from India probably, probably get. Uh, so why don't you come to my company and start teaching Excel? So that's how it started in 99. Since 99, I've taught several individuals and corporates in various cities in India. Uh, these are some of my customers. Uh, I teach in Oracle, EY, Mercedes-Benz, St. Cobain, Tyco Electronics, blah, 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 blah. So in all these places where I train, I also develop applications for all these companies, primarily based on Excel, Access, VBA, and off late from the last uh, five to six years, most of my work uh, has one of the three Power BI components as well. My last job was with this company called uh, Tyco Electronics, now called the Speed Connectivity. I left this job in Jan of 2007. So from February 2007, what was earlier a hobby has now become a full-time profession. So I teach Excel full-time, and when I'm not teaching, I'm developing applications using these technologies. Uh, we offer a few courses on Excel and related technologies. We do a course on basic Excel, which is aimed at uh, people who are just out of college. Uh, we do a course on advanced Excel for those of uh, those people who survived this course. <laughs> they join us for a course called Extreme Excel. Uh, we also do courses on Power BI and a few other courses as well. Uh, over the last 15 years, I've lost count of uh, how many sessions I have done, but I'm pretty certain we've put in almost 10,000 plus hours of uh, hours of training. All right, so that's it about myself. Uh, I'm just going to pause in case you want to ask me something. If not, we are going to jump into a demo. Don't have any questions here yet, Sam, um, but I appreciate your journey. It sounds familiar. <laughs> yes. All right, so uh, the tool that we are going to look uh, at today uh, is called uh, Universal uh, DC, DC for Data Consolidator. And uh, this is an inspiration from uh, the built-in connector that we already have in Power Query, uh, which is uh, the from folder or the from SharePoint folder connector. All right. So uh, if if you guys have worked with Power Query in the earlier days when it was called as Data Explorer, uh, this this connector was called Combined Binaries. All right. And essentially, was meant to combine a bunch of CSV files kept in a folder into a single table. Uh, later on, they extended it to work with uh, other file types like Excel or PDF. Uh, but, you know, the UI kind of more or less remained the same. And even though it's a quick and easy way to combine data, it has uh, a few limitations. So we, we are trying to overcome those limitations using this custom tool called Universal DC. So what does it do? Well, it lets you consolidate data from Excel files, any kind of Excel. Uh, any type of Excel file, the XLSX, XLSM, XLSB, which can be painful at times, 
or even the legacy file format, which is XLS. It can combine data from text files, again, uh, comma separated, other deal method, and it can also combine data from PDF files. Uh, the PDF file, uh, the PDF connector uh, does come with a rider. It works well if these are machine generated PDFs. Uh, if you have a scanned document, well, the, we really can't get guarantee the quality of output. It would depend on the quality of the scan. All right. So what all scenarios can it handle? Uh, it can handle a scenario where you have one file with uh, multiple sheets, uh, multiple files with a single sheet, multiple files with multiple sheets, in which case you can decide to either combine uh, data from all the sheets. You can decide to exclude a few sheets, include a few sheets. Uh, it also handles scenarios where you have inconsistencies in column names. So the column names could have changed over a period of time. Uh, new columns could have got added. Existing columns could have got removed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it also handles scenarios where uh, you have an offset at the starting point of your data. So data need not always start from cell A1. Uh, there could be both a row offset as well as a column offset. And sometimes uh, you might have scenarios where in each file this data starts at a different point. OK, so it, it handles that as well. Uh, it also lets you uh, exclude certain columns from the consolidated results. Uh, it also lets you exclude uh, files uh, that you might have kept in a folder that you do not want uh, consolidated. All right, so these are these are the various kinds of uh, scenarios that it can handle as of today, right? Um, so let's see how to use it. Uh, but before we start, uh, there are a few things you need to do. So we'll be sharing these files with all of you. Uh, Ken will put up the link and you can download these files from there. Um, so as uh, if, you, if you're in on the modern versions of Excel, the first thing you'll have to do is uh, right click on the file, go to properties, and you probably will see a an option called unblock at the bottom right corner. So you've got to say unblock and say OK. And then once you open the file, the usual stuff, uh, you've got to say enable content, enable connections and all that. All right. Uh, another thing that you might have to do uh, for this to work correctly is uh, in Power Query, you need to go to query options and uh, either at a file level or like what I've done at a global level, you can say always ignore privacy level setting. Uh, this is uh, because of the famous uh, formula firewall that comes into play whenever you try and combine data from more than one data source. All right. So we've taken the easy route out. <laughs> Rather than modifying the queries, uh, we, we're just saying if you want to consolidate data, just ignore ignore privacy for the time being. Right. All right. So. We then come to a sheet called set parameters and what you see are three tables which uh, let you control a few parameters about about this program. The table on the left first lets you decide what kind of data you're trying to consolidate. So we'll begin with uh, looking at Excel as the data source. OK, now what I've done already uh, is on my C drive inside a folder called data. Uh, I have folders named input 1 uh, to input 10. Each folder has a different data set uh, and each each data set uh, is going is going to have its own uh, unique problem. All right, so we're going to start with input 1. So let's see what we've got in input 1. So we seem to have a simple uh, a single file called data. Let me just see what we have there. And this is a file that has about 66 sheets. All right. Uh, one sheet for every custom. And uh, if I look at the columns, the columns seem to be the same everywhere. So I've got invoice number as the first column, rating as the last column. If I go to some other sheet, it has the exact same structure. Invoice number, the first column, rating the last column. Obviously, uh, the number of rows in every sheet are different. And what could happen over a period of time is new sheets could get added to this file or existing sheets could get deleted and our query should not break. It should still uh, handle the scenario, right? So this is what we have in input one. Uh, let's go to input two. 
So input two is uh, where we've got multiple files sitting in a folder. We've got about 31 files, one for each employee, right? So if I look at the first file, uh, again, the structure seems to be simple. It just has one sheet called sheet one. The columns are slightly different. We've got invoice number as the first column and hours here is the last column, all right? So the slight change in uh, the number of columns and the names of some of the columns compared to the earlier data set, right? Uh, but the good thing is all the other files are exactly uh, the same like what we saw earlier. So if I open, let's say Bruce, I see the same structure. It has one sheet. The name of the sheet is uh, sheet one. It has the same columns in the same order, right? So the first two folders uh, are what we call as ideal scenarios where everything is neat and nice, okay? Uh, but things start getting more and more complicated as we progress. So let's go to input three. And we again have one file for every person. And if I open the first one called Bruce, uh, this time you'll notice we've got two sheets, right? Uh, one called Bruce and the other called Wayne, right? So now we've lost control on how people are naming the sheets. So each person could have named the sheet in their own way. We also have no idea, therefore, how many sheets could be there in a file. So some files could just have one sheet, some file like this could have multiple sheets. But let's look at the columns. And if I look at the first one, it's invoice number. The last one is region. I go to the next sheet and it's the same there. Invoice number, the first column, region, the last column. But just to see if uh, the structure is the same everywhere else. If I open uh, Peter, you will see Peter has only one sheet uh, called sheet one. But the columns are still the same. Invoice number is still the first column, region is still the last column. Till I look at a file called Rob. And you'll see uh, this, this sheet doesn't have a column called region. All right. So now we are not sure about the columns. So we could have scenarios where certain files could have columns that might not be there in other files and vice versa. So region is a column that is missing uh, for this employee called Rob, right? And if I open this file called Tim, uh, you will see uh, we've got two sheets, one called sheet one, the other is sheet two. Sheet one is fine, invoice number is the first column, region is the last column. But in sheet two, which is for an employee called Cook, uh, Cook has an extra column called type that no other employee has, okay? So uh, things are slowly becoming more and more complex. Now uh, we'll skip input four for the time being and we'll look at input five. So in the data sets that we saw so far, uh, the common thing was data always started from cell A1, all right? But if you've ever taken an export from an ERP or one of these uh, standard uh, reporting applications, uh, you probably encounter scenarios where you have a set of rows on the top which are called as header rows, which have got nothing to do with your data, and your data is starting probably at, say, row number 10, okay? So this is what we have uh, in input five. So if I open this file called 2018, uh, we have a scenario where the first three rows are rows I want Power Query to ignore, all right? And my data is actually starting from cell A4. And in the year 2018, they called the columns as customer, country, sales year, right? And this data was uh, sitting on a sheet called data, but there was also a sheet called sheet one where someone went and created a pivot table, which obviously I want Power Query to ignore, right? So I only wanted to consider data uh, from the sheet data, right? So we should be able to tell Power Query to either include a few sheets and exclude the rest or the other way around, okay? But remember the columns uh, in the year 2018 where customer country sales here and uh, without warning you the next year someone decided to change the names of the columns right so now they are called as client uh, country revenue period in the year 2019 but they mean the same right and uh, 2020 they decided to rename them again okay so account country revenue here, right? And this again is a fairly common scenario where uh, column names change over a period of time, right? And our query should be able to handle this as well, okay? Now, uh, input six, 
uh, which is uh, which is an extreme uh, case. I don't think uh, most of us would face this scenario unless people are manually maintaining tables, right? So if your data is a system export, uh, system exports are generally consistent, uh, and whatever mistake happens once happens forever. But if people are people are manually maintaining tables, then what we are about to see could happen. So if I go to input six, I have three files. If I look at the first one called Bruce, uh, this uh, is a scenario where data is starting uh, from cell B21 on the first sheet uh, on the sheet called Bruce East. If I go to the next sheet, it starts from cell A25. In the next sheet, it starts at a different point. OK, uh, so in each sheet, the starting point of data is different, right? And in addition, uh, we've got a couple of sheets which we want Power Query to ignore. Uh, one is called summary, where there's a pivot table, and the other is called notes, where somebody just went and made some notes, all right? So this is the scenario that we have in input six, right? We'll look at the other folders a little bit later. Let's see how, how the universal DC pairs against these six folders. So the first thing, uh, as I said, that we have to specify is what kind of data are we talking to? So we are talking to Excel files, so we choose Excel from the dropdown. Uh, you can also uh, decide where to store these uh, folders. It could be a local, local uh, disk, it could be a network file share, or if you prefer, you could also store it uh, on a SharePoint or a OneDrive uh, folder as well. All right, but right now uh, we are storing it locally on the C drive. Uh, the next thing is to specify the path of your folder. So I'm going to change this to input one. And you'll notice when I say enter, uh, it's going to refresh uh, the other two tables on the right. So I'm hitting enter. It's going to take a few seconds uh, for it to refresh. So the table in the middle is telling us that it went to the folder and this is the file it found in the folder. And the table on the right uh, is giving me a list of unique columns that it found across all those 66 sheets in the file data. OK, so it went through every sheet to first build a list of uh, unique columns uh, that it found across all the files across all the sheets. All right. Now we'll see how these uh, two tables help us uh, a little later, but let's go to the next sheet where we have a refresh button. So this is some old data from a previous consolidation. So if I click on refresh, uh, it's going to go through all the sheets of that file and consolidate it into a single table. All right, so it takes about 10 to 15 seconds. Um, now we've kept our data sizes deliberately small. So this uh, data put together had about 33,000 rows. Uh, in a real world scenario, uh, you could have uh, much, much larger data and it should perform reasonably well on large data sets as well. All right. So uh, we had, remember, one sheet for every customer. And as you can see, uh, all, our, all our customers are listed in this filter drop down. Right. All right. Now uh, let's change input one to input two. Now remember, input two uh, had 31 files where every file had one sheet. So hitting enter first gives me a list of all the files it found in that folder. Uh, the table on the right shows me uh, a set of unique columns it found across all the 31, 31 files. Right. Now going to the next sheet and clicking on refresh. Remember we have one file for every employee and it's going to combine data from all those files back into a single table. So the columns uh, are slightly different from last time. If I look at the employee column, I see all my employees, Alan, Bruce, etc., etc. All right. Now uh, let's change two to three. Remember what we had in input three. Input three was the scenario where a few columns were there in one file, not in the other, and vice versa. All right. Now we know this because we actually opened a few files and we looked at the data. But when you do this in a, on a real-world data scenario, you are not going to discover this these kind of discrepancies 
uh, till the data comes and sits in a single table in on an Excel sheet, right? So for the time being, we'll assume we do not know that region is not there with employee Rob and type is the column that's there only uh, with one person for cook, right? So let's see if Power Query handles this. So we click on refresh and what Power Query does by default is you can see uh, type seems to be blank, uh, but when you click on the drop down, you do discover that there, there is some data in that column you want to find out who is the employee or employees who have something under this column called type. So you discover Cook is the only employee who has data in a column called type, right? And then if you look at column region, uh, you can see there's a blank here. So I want to know who is the employee who doesn't have anything uh, in the column region. I can see uh, Rob is the only employee who doesn't have data for the column region, right? So once you discover this, you can you can say, look, I'm quite happy with what it's done. Uh, wherever it didn't find data, it's just left it blank. But you might also say that, look, uh, there seems to be a problem with, uh, with these two columns. Uh, so let's, for the time being, exclude uh, these columns from the output. So we can come back to the set parameter sheet. And this is where the third table is going to help us. This table lets us decide whether we want to exclude a few columns from the output. So I'm going to say region is a column that has some problems, so we don't want it in the output. And type is a column that's there with just one person, so we don't want this column in the output. Right? So we can we can tell Power Query to exclude uh, these two columns. And of course, you can uh, exclude any other column as well. So for example, you can say age is a column that's no use to me uh, in the analysis I'm doing, so I'm going to say no to this. So I've excluded three columns, and if I go back to my sheet data, when I hit refresh, columns should disappear. So age is no longer there. Towards the end, uh, we had, remember, region and type, and they've disappeared as well. Okay. Right, now uh, we'll skip input four. We'll come back to it later and we will change uh, change this to input five. So input five was the uh, scenario where data was not starting from, uh, from cell A1. So we had a row offset, right? So how do we handle this? Uh, we simply tell uh, Power Query to skip three rows from the top, okay? And the other thing, remember in input five, was we had two sheets, uh, one called data and the other called sheet one. And we are only interested in a sheet called data. The other sheet, sheet one, had a pivot table, which we did not want. So I can now come and say sheets to keep as data. All right. Now, if there are more than one sheet that I want uh, to include, I can just separate it with a comma. But right now, it's just one sheet, which is data. So I'm going to say data. And then uh, it's not done a good job uh, with listing the columns. But now that we have specified these parameters, how many rows to skip from the top, which is the uh, sheet to include, I'll have to hit uh, the refresh column button manually. Hopefully it does a good job of listing the various columns it found. So customer country sales here, but it also listed client revenue period and account. All right. Now what this third table allows us to do is also remap columns, right? So I can say client is just a fancy name for customer. Uh, revenue is same as sales. Period is same as year. And account is same as customer. All right. So this tells Power Query that when you see a column called client, uh, rename it to customer. Okay. So going back to the data sheet and clicking on the refresh. So we have three years of data, 18, 19, and 20. All the columns are aligned into customer country sales here. Okay, all right. Now, uh, input six was was the uh, was the nightmare scenario, right? So we change uh, input five to input six, and uh, there are quite a few things uh, going wrong in the data set in input six. The first thing is it's not starting at the same point in all the sheets, in all the files, right? So you can't come and say uh, 
skip so many rows because the starting point is different everywhere. Nor can you say so many columns to skip. But if you're watching closely, <laughs> when I had opened that uh, file, Bruce, you would have noticed that there was indeed something common across the data sets. So if I open it again, you will discover that, uh, you know, no matter where data starts, uh, it always started with the field name called invoice number. So if I go to some other sheet, uh, there also uh, the first field is invoice number, right? So we have this to latch on. So we can tell Power Query, you go and figure out uh, where data starts look for this text called invoice number, right? Now uh, that's where uh, you can specify uh, text to find. I can come and say, uh, determine the rows to skip and columns to skip uh, by searching for this text called invoice underscore number, right? But things could be worse. Uh, maybe uh, the, the field name invoice underscore number was spelled differently in each sheet, right? So some people called it as invoice uh, hyphen number, invoice space number, et cetera, et cetera. All right. In which case, uh, you can ask Power Query to guess the starting point of data, right? So th this would be, as I said, a really, really extreme scenario and something that you would normally not face if you're dealing with system exports, but you could face this quite easily if people are manually entering data in their own files. OK, so I'm going to ask Power Query to guess the starting point of data. Now, uh, it would be too elaborate to specify sheets to keep, and therefore it's easier in this case uh, to tell Power Query sheets to remove or sheets to ignore. So there were two sheets there, one called summary, which had a pivot table, comma, the other called notes, where somebody I've just written some notes, right? So I'm going to say uh, ignore these two sheets and guess the starting point of data, right? So let's see if it uh, does a good job of uh, listing out the columns first. So I click on refresh columns, done a fairly good job. It's given me a list of all the columns. And here again, I can ask Power Query to remap columns. So I can say account is same as client. And maybe I don't want this column called Cal444. 4, 4, 5 month ID, so I'm going to say no. All right. Now, what we have not seen uh, so far is what do we do with this column called format, right? Why why do we need this column? So we'll see this in a bit. So I go to the next sheet and let's hit refresh. And we've got data consolidated from three files, right? Now, the problem here is, uh, you know, we have no ways of knowing uh, these rows belong to which employee. So remember we have data for three people, Bruce, Peter and Tim, uh, but uh, there was no column called employee anywhere in the data, right? Uh, so there's no way of determining uh, these rows came or roll up to which person. And that's where uh, this parameter helps us, which is called include file name, right? Now, ideally, uh, you, you shouldn't be storing information in file names. That information should be present uh, in a field in the data, but we don't live in an ideal world. So we are going to ask Power Query to add an extra column towards the end of the data, which has the name of the uh, name of the file, which in turn is the name of the person. That will help us determine, uh, you know, this uh, particular set of data rolls up to which employee, right? So I've just said uh, include file name as yes. I'm going to hit the refresh button again. So there should be a column in the end telling me uh, each row coming from which person or which file, right? So sometimes uh, it's useful to have uh, a column telling us the source of the data, right? All right, now uh, we're going to pause uh, before we move on to the other folders. Any any questions so far? Any doubts? Sam, I've got one question for you. This is amazing. I, I'm I'm really impressed. Uh, one question though, just on the uh, the file name, because you know naturally, I mean, you, you give me something like that, and I always want just a tiny bit more. Um, is there an option that you you have included or thought of for actually um, excluding the file extension when you include you the file? Yep. Okay. 
<laughs> that's coming up. All right, fair enough. That, that's the only question I had, and I don't see any others that are in the chat at this point. Okay. So, all right. So uh, uh, we will we'll get to that. But uh, yes, if you want, uh, you know, we we could do some ETL on that column. So I kind of deliberately uh, left it out simply because the file names are not likely to be so simple, you know, like Bruce, Peter, and Tim. Uh, people have a habit of uh, putting in a lot of information in a file name. So there might be a date time stamp, an underscore, a region, and another underscore. And the file the file length could be a half a kilometer long, right? So there, there's no real uh, there's no real benefit I saw in just removing the extension because in a real world scenario you might actually have to do much more. You might have to say text before delimiter, text between delimiters, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to get some meaningful uh, information from the file, right? But we could very easily exclude the extension uh, as well. Or, all right. Now, uh, if if there are no further questions, uh, we we're going to look at the uh, the other folders. Uh, but before that, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, this column here called format. Right now, what you'll notice is uh, if you look at the way uh, the dates have been stored in those files, uh, this is not not really the classic date format. So if I click on the invoice date. I'm not going to get my date filters and my automatic grouping is not going to happen. OK, and that's because uh, we've basically gone with the default uh, data type in Power Query, which is any, but you can easily uh, specify uh, a data type for each column. So I can say invoice date uh, needs to be a date. Uh, all the others here are text, right? And quantity actuals are is a number number here means uh, something that can support decimal numbers as well and region again is a text whereas territory key is a number and the rest uh, rest are numbers and since since we did not want uh, column uh, cal 444445 month id we are not going to specify this but client is again a text call right so we can we can go and choose the data type uh, for every column and then uh, clicking on the refresh button should give me my regular date filters and I can go and apply any kind of a date filter on this column. OK, all right. Now uh, let's look at what we've got in the other folder. So going to input seven, we've got CSV files, uh, one for each region. We've got north, south, east, west, and central. So what I'll do for the time being is I'll cut one of them and paste it outside. So we'll paste central out. So we've got uh, in input seven, uh, four files, uh, one for each region, right? And the first thing I need to therefore do is instead of Excel, I need to go and choose text in the first drop down. So <laughs> text is a much simpler structure compared to an Excel file. Uh, less things can go wrong. So we don't have to specify rows to skip, columns to skip, but we do have to specify the delimiter. So CSV uh, and comma is therefore the delimiter. And encoding is something you need to sometimes worry about when, when you're dealing with uh, special characters, uh, which if you don't specify the right encoding, will come up garbled in, in the output, right? So what we've also done here is given you all the common encodings that you're likely to encounter. UTF-8 is a fairly popular one, so we're going to go with UTF-8. Now there's no hard and fast rule as to which one to choose. This will entirely depend on uh, which encoding was used to generate those CSV files in the first place. OK, so it could be different uh, in your case, right? So in, in my case, I know it's UTF-8, so I'm going to go with UTF-8. And then uh, we're going to change input 7, uh, input 6 to input 7. We got the, uh, we got the four files listed. Uh, it's done a refresh of the columns, and I click on refresh here. Yeah. Now, if you're pulling data from uh, Excel, certain uh, data type conversions happen automatically. Okay, 
So numbers, typically uh, Excel recognizes them as numbers and stores them in the Excel table as numbers. But when you're pulling data from text or CSV, everything is going to come as text in the output. So if you look at invoice date, you can see the only thing getting displayed at the bottom right corner is count, which means this is just text. Uh, so is ours. Ours is just text. OK, now uh, if, if you if you're wanting to use this data on a pivot table, right? And then if you drag and drop uh, invoice date into the row area, you're not going to uh, get the automatic grouping option that you have in the pivot. Or if you put hours into the data area, it's not going to do a sum of hours. Instead, it's going to do a count. All right. So again, uh, we're going to change the data type. So we're going to say let's make invoice date as a date. And just to save time, say all these columns here are numbers, right? We leave the others as any. And then let's see, we do a refresh. Sure enough, we've got dates now. So if I if I select the dates, all six parameters are getting displayed at the bottom right. Uh, same thing for hours. So now these are numbers and not text numbers. OK, now you've probably uh, been wondering about this one button that I have not clicked on yet. So sometimes uh, you don't want to see the data in the form of a table uh, because probably it exceeds the uh, 1 million row limit that you have uh, in Excel. Uh, and therefore you can't dump it in the form of a table. So you want to look at it in the form of a pivot table. So you click on this button pivot and it removes removes the table and in the same place uh, gives you a pivot table that is connected to the same query uh, that we saw earlier, right? So I can then uh, come and start analyzing my data. I can drag invoice date into the row area and because I, I converted it to a date, I'm going to get my automatic uh, grouping options that I have. I can put hours into the data area and it's not going to do a count of hours. It's going to do a sum of hours because I use the right data type. All right. So setting the right data type is important uh, when you want to see the output in the form of a pivot table rather than a table or if you plan to load the data into a data model. OK, of course, uh, again, ideally you shouldn't be directly loading the data into the data model without doing some data modeling first. All right. So at least you should be breaking it up into facts and dimensions before loading it. But uh, if, you, if you just want to do something quick and easy and you want to make use of a distinct count, which is not there in a normal pivot, uh, then probably you can just load it into a data model directly. Now I'm going to make it back to the table view and uh, go to the next folder. So uh, just as it takes uh, handle CSV files. It also handles other delimited files. So what we have in uh, folder input eight are text files with pipe as a delimit. All right. So all we all we need to do is change the delimiter from comma to pipe, right? And change input seven. So we just have two files, 18 and 19. You've got the columns listed. Then clicking on refresh, consolidated data. Okay. Now, finally, uh, the last file type is PDF, which is what we have uh, in the folder input nine, a set of PDF files, one for every employee. Now, this is a machine generated PDF. As I said, it won't work very well if this was uh, an output of a scanned document. All right. Uh, so let's see how it handles PDF files. I'm going to change uh, input input eight to input nine, and the PDF files are going to be the slowest ones to uh, read. Right. Uh, the text files are going to be the fastest, followed by XLSX and XLSM, then followed by XLSB in the legacy file formats and the slowest are going to be the PDF files. So it, it did a fairly good job. It gave me a list of the files. It gave me a list of the columns. Now if I come to the sheet data, hit refresh, 
should go and consolidate data from all those uh, 11 PDF files that I have. Just to be sure, I can see these are all PDF files. All right. All right. Input 10 is for you guys to dump uh, dump your data here, try it out, and uh, come back to us in case it doesn't work. Okay. So I'm not saying it's going to handle every scenario, but uh, I do feel it covers at least 60 to 70 percent of uh, the scenarios that you're likely to face when you're trying to consolidate data. Right now, there's also a Power BI desktop version of this file, which is uh, unfortunately not not as uh, advanced, for the want of a better word, as the Excel file. Okay. That's because uh, we don't have a scripting language inside of uh, Power BI desktop yet, right? So nothing's going to happen automatically. <laughs> you, you'll you have to go and click, uh, click in various places uh, to get the updated data, all right? But essentially, uh, the philosophy remains the same, right? So uh, we come to edit parameters and you can specify, uh, you know, where you've stored your data, you can specify in which uh, folder you've stored your data, what kind of uh, file type are you dealing with, rows to skip, columns to skip, and the other parameters that we saw, right? And then uh, the only place where it's going to load the data is into the data model because there's nothing called as a sheet in, in Power BI Desktop. All right. All right. So, We are done for the time being. Uh, any any questions from? Yeah, Sam. Uh, there's one question from, and I hope I pronounce your name right, uh, Shubham. Uh, in the case of input five, you'd skip three rows from the top. Can you also skip rows from the bottom? Oh, uh, <laughs> not not yet. But uh, that's something important. We can easily include that as well. There you go. Well, hopefully that answers that question. Uh, the only other comment that I had in here was from Stanton uh, from from the last time I asked questions. He just said, uh, "No questions when you're blown away." I mean, I, this is this is impressive, Sam. There's a lot of stuff going on in this, uh, and it's very well thought out. And uh, yeah, wow, I, I'm I'm itching to see the power query behind all this. Right. So we'll we'll touch base on that. Uh, <laughs> I would encourage everyone to take a look under the hood. <laughs> so. Uh, a lot happening. Uh, we've got some parameters. We've got uh, some functions. Uh, we've got one landing query, one loading query. Terms that I learned from Ken. <laughs> there you go. Uh, OK, well, hey, we have another question came in as well. Um, a couple more, actually. There we go. So uh, with PDF files, sometimes there's multiple tables in the same file. Can your great tool handle those kind of files? Uh, well, it depends on what you mean by multiple tables. So let me let me show you the scenario it can handle. Uh, so we've got multiple pages here, all right, but uh, it's essentially the extension of the same table. So this is a scenario it can handle, all right, but uh, but I know where you're coming from. So if if you've got a PDF file, which is probably a bank statement, right, where you've got a table here, Maybe another table here, and then the actual table is starting from here. So this is something that we've not yet uh, built into, but uh, it, it will come someday. All right. Uh, Dominic is asking, uh, is there an option to transpose data, data in rows uh, you want to consolidate? Right, so there's no real ETL happening. Uh, the entire thing uh, that you see is actually built on one single function, which is the fantastic uh, table dot All right, so we, we're not doing anything with with the data other than consolidating it, right? So of course, uh, you know, in, in the real world, your journey wouldn't stop uh, at this stage. Uh, you would actually uh, first consolidate the data, and then you probably clean up a few columns, do some unpivot, you know, remove some. Uh, apply some filters on your data. All that, of course, uh, would be the future steps. But what, what we are aiming uh, with this tool is to first get your data into a single table. Then 
you you uh, you would probably reference this query, then move forward with the other ETL steps. All right. Uh, I don't see any other questions yet. Oh, wait, here we go. A um, couple more. So uh, <laughs> I missed this part of the presentation. I'm wondering if the tool is available for download. I don't think you've actually said yet, so that's probably a good question. Yes, it's available for download. I'm going to share the link uh, with uh, Ken. Ken is going to share it with all of you. Download it, give it a spin. Let me know if it doesn't work. All right, and another question uh, from Curtis here. Um, first, the tool is fantastic. I know this is off topic from the tool, but you have a data mining tab in the analyze tab uh, when you're on tables. Is that the old Microsoft data mining add-in? Didn't know it could work with Microsoft 365. Plus, you've really customized your home tab, which is something I mentioned to you before. Uh, is that a, is that a custom Power BI tab you built? Right, so I got tired of jumping from one tab to the other when I'm working with Power BI. And I put in a couple of suggestions to Microsoft telling them, look, guys, got to bring everything together. You know, uh, things work better together, not just in presentations. <laughs> so get get all the Power BI components in one place. So that's what we've done here. So the buttons uh, starting from left to right up to here belong to uh, obviously uh, Power Query and uh, from uh, this is uh, this is uh, data modeling. The last bit this is the data visualization tab. Uh, one button that is missing right now, again thanks to Microsoft, is Power View. Okay, the product that nobody wants to talk about. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so the product uh, the product that had enormous potential uh, but uh, got off on the wrong start, <laughs> and uh, you know. There was a time I, I remember there was a blog post where they said uh, they're going to let you uh, insert Power BI visuals in Excel directly, but that project kind of uh, went into cold storage. Yeah, I really never know. Yeah, maybe maybe you know. one day it'll come back. Maybe we'll see. I I I, I keep hoping that yeah that we'll be able to use the Power BI visuals and, and custom visuals actually in in Excel Canvas would be fantastic. But yep. no no idea if that will get revived or when. Yeah, and data mining, as you rightly guessed, is the old data mining tools. I had to hack it to make it work for Office 365. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you how to do it now. Talk to me separately after the call. <laughs> there, there you go, Curtis. So, uh, yeah, reach out to, to Sam individually, and uh, and you can get some help on that one. Right. So, the home tab uh, is uh, again because I got bored of jumping from one tab to the other. So, uh, during the pandemic, we were all at home. <laughs> so, stay at home became the motto. Uh, so, <laughs> that's what we've done in Excel. It's a set of. Uh, both built-in tools and uh, some extra extra tools as well. For example, one thing uh, that I found myself doing very frequently is start typing something and then discover that I didn't switch on the caps lock or didn't switch it off, right? And then uh, I was infuriated that, uh, you know, Excel doesn't have a toggle case button, but Word does have it, right? <laughs> so, so I said there's no point in submitting ideas and waiting for 1000 votes, right? So we build a toggle case button. And now that we have toggle case, you definitely would want a proper case, right? And then, uh, you know, you would have uh, tables of data where let's say you want to insert a blank row between every every cell that you've selected. So you got uh, insert alternate rows. And sometimes you get data with a lot of blank rows and blank columns, especially if you're importing data from other applications. And then you want to normalize your data. So again, there's no easy way of doing it. So we've got delete blank rows and delete blank columns. OK, so like this, we've got, uh, you know, lots of uh, lots of small, small things that help you be more productive in your day to day work. Uh, another thing that I found uh, pretty strange is uh, if I had to select, um, say, all cells from uh, here to here, uh, it was pretty simple to do. Uh, you just say shift control down arrow and you're done. 
till you discover that uh, it works provided you have no gaps in your data. And moment you have got gaps in your data, uh, again, there's no really easy way of uh, solving this problem of selecting data, which is why we gave you the blue down arrow and the blue right arrow. OK, but that's two clicks, which is too much. So you have this button called select all data, <laughs> which selects everything from the first cell to the last cell that has data. All right. So like this, uh, you've got uh, Lot, lots of uh, both built in features and some custom features that have been added to the home tab. You know, this just makes me laugh. It reminds me of uh, my, my mom used to give me a hard time when I was a kid. She said I would spend more time planning how to unload the dishwasher efficiently than I would actually <laughs> doing the work. But I'll tell you, by the time I left my house, I could get that darn thing unloaded in 30 seconds, right? I'm like, it's all about planning. And I, I feel the same with this, right? You get a, a programmer that's frustrated by making one click, so they'll spend 40 hours programming something to save themselves <laughs> this 30 seconds, right? But, uh, beautiful. So is is that part of, uh, uh, is that part of your universal data consolidator tool that you have no, like these things are or this is something different that you build no, there's something separate uh it's it's available to anyone who undergoes the torture of attending my training program <laughs> <laughs> there you go <laughs> uh that's funny there you are um all right i'm trying to think it doesn't look like there's any other questions coming in sam all right so uh just a comment that uh that they're impressed with the tools there you go Coming to you shortly. Play around with the play with it, and uh, if it doesn't work for your scenario, get in touch, and we'll see if we can improve it. I, I am curious if the um, you'd mentioned as far as like customizing the file name. Is that something that's built into the tables here, or would you just oh, go into no. the Power Query and, and change oh, that? We'll have to we'll have to go into the Power Query and say okay. Text the limit. Yeah. Right, but of course, I mean the Power Query is right in the file, so I mean if you want to make further modifications, you can just edit it, and and away you go. Absolutely. All you have to do is edit. Uh, go to the query folder and then do anything you want further. Gotcha. Fantastic. That makes sense. Excellent. Um, so Curtis is asking if you do, how often do you update your tool? All right. Uh, so <laughs> there was, uh, I was uh, chatting with uh, someone in the Power Query team and uh, they have a blog, which I don't think is uh, adequately advertised. And adequately looked after. Uh, you know, there are hardly any technical articles on this blog. So I said, uh, let me write one for you. So I wrote uh, the Universal uh, Data Consolidator. And I want to put this link in the chat window. And this was some time ago. And since then, we've made some improvements. For example, uh, the file that's available for download here. I uh, did not at that time have the ability to uh, specify the format of the columns, right? Someone said uh, it would be nice if uh, the user could uh, specify the output data format through Excel rather than having to go into Power Query. So we added this column and then we made a few more improvements. Uh, so this tool keeps improving uh, as time progresses. Hopefully one of you said you wanted uh, to also exclude rows from the bottom, right? So who knows? I may put that in my to-do list next. I'm uh, I'm going to throw you another suggestion too, Sam. While you're uh, while you're thinking about uh, potential improvements, uh, one of the flags that you have on there is what is the folder type? Is it local or is it or local network or is it uh, OneDrive SharePoint? And and I know why that's there is because they obviously use different connectors in order to do that. Yep. Um, what would be a cool improvement is if uh, I mean, because there is a way to actually be able to build a function that will actually a smart switch between the two so that if it comes in, if the file path comes in with an HTTPS path, it just uses SharePoint OneDrive. And if it doesn't, then it uses local network. It would be awesome if you didn't even have to make that choice. Agreed. Agreed. So uh, the reason the reason, uh, you know, I've kept it uh, distinct for the time being is uh, what it does when it when you choose uh, local stroke network, when you key in the uh, file path is it determines that uh, the folder actually exists. Now, as far as I know, there's no way to determine whether a SharePoint folder actually exists, right? Mm -hmm. Fair so enough, I yeah. To, I had to build this uh, switch <laughs> that gotcha. uh, allow, allowed people to then come and. Uh, and uh, since you mentioned about um, 
SharePoint uh, path. SharePoint path would have to be broken up into two. So the first one uh, would typically say is cannot check if uh, the folder actually exists, right? So mm -hmm. you have to, you have to check by clicking on the refresh file list button. And there is also a folder sub path, right? So uh, which is the other the other part of the string. Now uh, right. this is to end with a backslash and uh, the folder sub path, which would typically look like this. Uh, this is where I've actually hosted uh, hosted the download. So for example, it has the same structure. So I'm going to say input to backslash at the end. Right. And then um, if I click on refresh file list, now this of course is going to take the max amount of time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> compared to storing it locally. Uh, but uh, as you can see, uh, it's gone and built the list of those 31 files has given you the columns. And when you hit on refresh, you've got the data consolidated uh, from the cloud. Which, oops, something's gone wrong. <laughs> this is why you never answer a question like what I just oh, gave you alive, right? <laughs> <laughs> let's see, let's see. Uh, well, uh, gone wrong. Sorry, buddy. Didn't mean to break your demo. That's uh, that oh. wasn't my goal here. Oh no, no. So. But I, I can promise you it worked, <laughs> and I know it works. Start something. Okay. So let's let's let me figure out what's what's happening. <laughs> I missed out something here. All right, well, then let me let me figure out what's going on. But it yeah, does no work. Uh, I I have faith it works honestly. I mean, and yeah. and I know that like you know that this is the tricky part when dealing with SharePoint is right. I mean, whether you're working with your whether you're working with OneDrive for Business or whether you're working with a SharePoint URL, the URLs are different. Whether it's stored in the root of the document library or subfolder, it gets different. Like it is tricky, and I mean, I totally I've been fighting that recently. I, I totally get it, but uh, it, it is. I, I've always been. I'm secretly questing or not so secretly questing for that that you know that that one overall thing where you can just put in the file path and it doesn't matter especially because if you're using the cell function to drive something in excel today as as you know when you open it up and if it's in a sync folder it, it returns the web path and if you can't get the local path back from it it's really frustrating right so having that smart switch for for some of these things is uh, i i think is the holy grail along with a lot of the stuff of, of making it work. So it's just a suggestion, but I mean, I also know it's hard. So um, for for what it's worth, but um, any rate, listen, I, I think this is a, I think is a fantastic tool. I'm I'm blown away honestly with uh, with how um, slick that is with just changing a few uh, a few different fields in the in the worksheet grid. Uh, it works very very nicely. This is impressive stuff, Sam. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, and yeah, I will. Uh, I will wait to get your email. We'll make sure that we post a link uh, to the tool on the uh, the meetup site so that uh, so that people can get access to it. And um, I, as I say, I don't see any other questions uh, coming in on this one. Um, so uh, Sam, thanks so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. To say fantastic Thank work. Thank you please, for your time. Thank you so much. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can uh, we can have you back again in uh, in future and uh, and talk about uh, some of the updates and stuff that you've you've made to it, which I, I'm I have no doubt you will. So awesome. My next project, uh, which I'm working on <laughs> during my spare time, is an Excel paginated report builder. Okay, so stay tuned. Nice, awesome, very cool. Good stuff. Well, listen, when you got it ready, let me know. We'll we'll make sure that we have you back so you can actually show us. That'd be cool. Awesome. And on on that note, um, I want to thank everybody for coming. And uh, as I say, we'll make sure that we get the uh, recording up within the next twenty four to forty eight hours. And um, yeah, hopefully uh, we'll see you back in the next one. Don't forget that we've got uh, Parv Chana and uh, Chandu coming up for our next two meetups. Uh, those should be open for RSPs, RSVPs. So uh, we will all see you all at the next one. Till then. Have a great one.